starting back even before the first meeting in Paris of 2017. Um, so today we're going to talk to you about, I'm going to present some background about how the project was done, and then uh, Susan will present some of the results. So this development of the survey was guided by research questions that we agreed to at the Paris meeting in 2017. So the goal of the survey and all the questions that were on the survey had to some way support these goals or help us to answer these questions was to understand the development of interest in science, so that's the early years, um, understand people's experiences in education and careers and whether there is a gender gap there, look at the work-life balance for scientists, um, how do people who um, work as scientists balance it with the rest of their lives, family support, like someone uh, we were just discussing earlier um, and when I was talking here with my colleagues that uh, many scientists have support from their families, friends, mentors, things like that. We also looked at the demographics of the scientific workforce. And then one of the things we really wanted to look at was um, access to resources needed to conduct science and then opportunities to contribute to the scientific enterprise because our thinking was that these are areas where we might find inequality. So everyone in the survey is already a scientist and what we wanted to know is for people who are scientists, is there equality in these things? Because if you don't have access to the resources that you need, then it's difficult to compete or to get your findings published. And if you don't have those opportunities, then your career may not advance as quickly. So those were the research questions that we agreed to in Paris. Um, we also wanted to look at whether or not ex experiences are different in different geographical regions. And Susan will be showing you a map of the regions that we looked at. Um, by discipline, so the disciplines that were covered by the partner unions experiences that scientists have with different levels of human development. So we use the UN Human Development Index, and Susan's going to present some results on that. And then also experiences people have in different employment sectors. Um, to work on the questionnaire, we started with an initial draft that was based on the 2009 IUPAP, that's the Physics Global Survey of Physicists. IUPAP has done three global surveys of physicists, and we, um, the first two were only of women, and the third one included men, so we'd have a comparison group to compare the uh, women to the men to see if there was a gap. And so we started with that survey because it was important to IUPAP to have some longitudinal results so we could see if things have changed. Um, we started with that draft of the questionnaire, but then we had three regional meetings. These were in different regions of the world that um, we wanted to make sure were included in the um, development of the questionnaire because we wanted to make sure that the questionnaire worked for all scientists in all types of countries. And so this was a great opportunity for us to get input on the questionnaire from people who um, we ordinarily might not be able to talk to to make sure that the questions worked for them. So there was an initial meeting, there were meetings in Colombia where people gathered from um, Latin America. Taiwan hosted by uh, my <laughs> Mayhoon, um, hosted by Mayhoon in um, to for scientists from Asia, and then uh, s hosted in South Africa to for um, scientists from Africa. At the workshops, we asked people to review the specific questions on the draft to make sure that they were going to work for all the regions represented. They, we didn't want it to be Western biased or Europe-based or North American-based. Um, everyone looked at the full survey instrument. Um, we call questionnaires instruments because it's what we use to measure things. I'm a sociologist, by the way. And 
we wanted to, again, make sure that the questions worked for everyone. And we also talked to the delegates at those regional workshops about um, dis distributing the questionnaire so it would get out to the people um, in less developed areas of the world. And so some of you attended the regional workshops, and I remember many of you from the two that I went to. Once the final questionnaire was approved by the executive committee of the project, we used a professional translation service in the U.S. that's used to translating uh, questionnaires into languages, specifically questionnaires. We wanted to ensure comparability across languages, and the translation services use you know, standard language things so that there's not idioms in there that are specific to different countries. Um, and they can be neutral about cultural differences. And then to make sure that the translation and had the proper translation for science type things, we had people on the project review the uh, final translation to make sure that they were okay. And their names are listed here, Marie Francoise for French, Sylvina for Spanish, um, Seiko for Japanese. I don't think she's here. I looked through the program and I didn't see her name. Okay. Um, but she was very helpful with the Japanese translation. And um, Mina and Shahrazad, who are both here, helped us with Arabic. And then um, we had staff members at AIP that helped with Russian and simplified ch Chinese. The survey launched on May 1st of 2018 and was open until the end of the year. And um, you can see it was in, available in seven languages, English, French, uh, I don't know which is Chinese and Japanese, <laughs> Russian, Spanish, and Arabic. One of those is Chinese and one is Japanese. Um, so my apologies for not knowing that. <laughs> Thank you. Chinese first, says Marie Francoise, and Japanese second. So the way the questionnaire was distributed, there's no list from which to draw um, a sample, a representative sample of scientists. We don't have a worldwide list of scientists. We don't even have country-level lists of scientists. Um, so we sent it to people that we knew. Some people sent it to lists of people that they knew, but still those lists weren't necessarily representative. And then there were ways that people were asked to forward the questionnaire to their colleagues. So there were instructions at the end of the survey in the cover letter that said you can forward it to your colleagues. Now this is a way that social scientists use to get questionnaires out when there's no uh, list of the group they're trying to study. But that means that it's not representative of the entire population. Indeed, we don't know who's in the entire population, and we can't make generalizations to the population. However, this method does allow us to make important comparisons between men and women who answered, and I think there are many things that we can learn from the results of this survey. But I wanted you to know that this was how it was done, and so when you see the results of the survey, you can't conclude that you know scientists in North America are like this, and scientists in Western Europe are like the other thing, because it's not representative, not necessarily representative of those scientists. Here are the number of respondents by discipline, and these are the disciplines. I didn't mention them at the beginning, but they're um, represented by the partner unions, so astronomy, biology, chemistry, computer science, math, math applied, and physics. Um, there were also many, well, not many, there were some respondents in the history of science, which was one of the partner unions. And some people chose other disciplines because it was open to basically any scientist. And some people didn't answer that question. So in total, we had about 30,000 respondents, um, 21,000 or 22,000 from these disciplines. About half were men and half were women. So um, this is, again, not representative of the actual population of scientists because we know they're not half men and half women for most of the disciplines. However, women do tend to respond more frequently to surveys than men, and we were also targeting women because we wanted to make sure we had enough women to do our analysis. So we were pleased with the number of... Um... Okay, in the results that you'll see, applied math is shown as a subset of math, so... Um... 
I don't know if you have any slides about that, but we'll see. Okay. Now, there were, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about our analysis plan. In your report, there's some bivariate or what we've called bivariate uh, results because these are easy to see on a chart. Susan here um, is holding up, my colleague is holding up some bivariate charts. And the reason for this is it's easy, to, it's easy to visualize. You can see like here's a bar for men and here's a bar for women and you can see what the difference is between the two genders. Um, you can also test in that simple way to see if there's a statistically significant difference between the women and the men. And so it's a good way people like to look at these bivariate charts. However, this analysis can be confounded by um, other variables that are not accounted for in the chart. For example, we may have, um, you know, it may look like there's a difference between men and women, but it really could be that the men in our group have more experience in their careers than the women. So for this reason, um, yeah, it's different st career stages. Let me go to the next slide. So we also did, and you'll see this at the beginning of our report, what we call multivariate analysis. These are statistical models where we account for these confounding factors such as age, discipline, um, employment sector. It's hard to visualize those results, but Susan's going to give them to you. And um, what you see in here is, for example, if we show you the results of a multivariate analysis, that means, and there's a gender difference, it means that controlling for all the other things that could make a difference in that variable, we still see um, a gender difference. So it's a mo more robust way to look at, at the uh, gender differences. So as I've already mentioned, we did both bivariate and multivariate. Um, multivariate, we think, have the uh, stronger results. So again, we're gonna, we started our report with the analysis of men's and women's differences overall. And we did some bivariate analysis, um, which you see in the report. We looked at tables with gender within each discipline, gender within geographic region, and gender within a grouped level of development. That was using the United Nations Human Development Index. And now I'm gonna turn this over to Susan, who's new to the project, but not new to the American Institute of Physics, and she's gonna talk about the results. Thank you. Rachel promised I would show you a map, and I did have a map in the earlier version of the slide, so now I'm gonna show you a map. This is the second page two, it is the map of the, the uh, regions, the geographic regions we used. So, you don't have to know it right now. Yeah, you don't really have to know it. I just wanted to fulfill that promise that Rachel had made. This um, is what happens when two people do a presentation. When two people do a presentation, both of whom are jet lagged at the very end and <laughs> trying to remember what was going to be in the slides. But I'm a statistician, and when you do statistics, you have to worry about a type 1 error risk. Um, it's like a false positive. It's when, if you reject a true null, and if you've ever done any hypothesis testing, you know about that magic alpha, and if the p-value you get is less than alpha, you reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative. Um, when you're doing so many tests, because if, if you look at that report, there, there are a lot of, of those bivariates in there, and there, we ran a lot of multivariate analyses. If you don't adjust alpha, you're gonna, things are gonna show up as statistically significant even when they're really not because you've made a type one error. Of course, you don't know you've made a type one error. So the way to get around that, we use Bonferroni, we, we, you adjust alpha, you make alpha lower. You divide by the number of things in a family-wise comparison. And so instead of using 0.05 or 0.01, which are common, we use 0.002. So that, that's really all you need to know. If you would like to have a discussion about type one analyses, uh, errors, I'm here all week. Um, so to cut to the chase, I'm, I'm now looking only at the multivariate analyses. There was only one item we looked at which did not have statistically significant differences for men and women. Now, 
again, we're not testing for the population. This test is if we had a different group of randomly selected respondents. If the snowball had gone to a different group of people, would we have still gotten this result? That, that's the statistical test. It's not about the population. So only one. In every other, and that was when did you choose your discipline? There was, there was no, we couldn't find, after accounting for the confounding factors, we did not see a difference in when you choose your discipline. Everything else we looked at, there was a difference. Now, I'm going to give you a test, although the answer is already up there. Um, if you think women's experiences, no, no, let me go the other way. If you think men's experiences were more positive than women's, you know, raise your hand. Let's stretch a little bit and get awake. I want to know you're awake out there. Okay. Thank you. Yes, you're correct. Um, in every instance, every instance, men's experiences were more positive than women's. That's after accounting for all the confounding factors. We use logistic regression and ordinal logistic regression um, because the dependent variable in some cases was yes, no, that's binary, so that's logistic regression. In other cases, it was strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree, so that's an ordinal variable or ordinal logistic regression. So we use those two things. Uh, with logistic regression, it's easy to look at a coefficient and come up with something called an odds ratio, how much more likely is one group to do something than another group. And so in this, I do report odds ratios. With the ordinal logistic, the odds ratio is more complicated because it depends on where you started on strongly agree or you know, strongly disagree and how many levels you want to move. So I just report the direction of the movement, ah, as I just said. Now, a reminder, and I, you may think Rachel and I are beating this into you, but um, stressing, 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 same age, same discipline, same employment sector, same geographic region, same level of development. That's what we mean by holding all other variables constant. So when I look at this, I'm looking at a man and a woman for whom everything else is the same. They're the same age, they're in the same discipline, they work in the same employment sector, they live in the same geographic region, and they're in a country with the same level of development. By the way, for the multivariate, we use the, the actual score, the Human Development Index score. For the bivariate, we classified it into two groups. We had highly developed and very highly developed in one group, and medium and low development in another group. So that was the bivariate, because to do the bivariate, you have to have discrete groups. But in the multivariate, we could just use the, we'll call it continuous variable. So it's analysis of the gender gap, so here we go. And let's smile. Timing of your, when you chose your field. And we, the question we used was, when did you choose your primary field of study? So after accounting for the age of the respondent, the discipline of the respondent, the region, the development index, we found no statistically significant difference between men's and women's responses. So that was, that's the happy news. Doctoral program experiences. How would you rate the quality of your doctoral program? After accounting for age, discipline, geographic region, development index, men rated their program quality higher than women. Surprise? In my doctoral experience, I had support from my advisor or supervisor. Men were more likely to agree or strongly agree than women. After accounting for what? Age, discipline, geographic region, development index. So I'm, I'm trying to stress here, you can't, people can't look at these results and say, well, that's because they lived in different places, or they studied different things, or they're different ages. No, we've, we've already accounted for that. This is after accounting for that. Interruptions in your doctoral studies. This was a yes, no question. So I can report an odds ratio. Women were 1.6 times more likely 
to report an interruption than men. Current workplace experiences. And for these, I also wanted to use employment sector because I can imagine that working in academics is not the same as working in a primary or secondary school or working for an NGO. Um, at my current job, my employer treats everyone fairly. Men were more likely, even after accounting for age, discipline, geographic region, employment sector, and development index. Co-workers are respectful of everyone. Men were more likely to agree. I feel like I'm, we're bringing the mood of the room down. Career progress. Uh, yeah, we asked the respondents, how, how, do you compare, how do you compare your career progress with people who graduated at the same time as you? Men were more likely to report a faster response, uh, career progress than women. Now again, these are perceptions. We, we don't have any absolute measures of career progress. We didn't ask for rank or salary or any of that. So these are perceptions. But perception can be reality. Uh, do you think your salary is same, higher, lower? Men think they make more. That's regardless of age, discipline, region, development index, and employment sector. So here's one of the career advancing opportunities, for example. Men were 1.2 times more likely to have been invited to give a talk at a conference. We had, we had several questions on discrimination. One of them was, I have never experienced discrimination. Men were five times more likely to say, I have never experienced discrimination than women. Five times. And that's not even the biggest number. Has your career influenced your decisions about your personal life? Women, 1.6 times more likely to say yes than men. Becoming a parent. So we had a statement, my career or rate of promotion slowed significantly when I became a parent. Women were about three times more likely to agree. My work or career did not change significantly. Men were three times more likely than women to agree. I mean, that, that's what you call consistency in your results. Um, I did not make up those numbers. That, that's what they came out to be. Here's the number. I have encountered sexual harassment at school or work. Speaking specifically now to sexual harassment. After accounting for age, after accounting for discipline, after accounting for employment sector, after accounting for geographic region, and after accounting for the Human Development Index, women were more than 14 times more likely to say yes than men. And again, you can't say, well, that's because this person works in this industry and this person works you know, in academics. You can't say, oh, it's because this person is in astronomy and that person's in biology. No, we've already accounted for all of that. Dual careers in physics, I've come from the American Institute of Physics, although I'm a statistician. Um, in physics, this is called the two-body problem. Um, but it's dual careers. So, you know, finding two, two jobs together. If, if you're in the same field, it can be a lot harder to find two jobs in the same geographic area. And women were three times more likely to say their spouse was in the same discipline than men. So women may have a harder time dealing with the dual career issue. So that was all the men and women, that we were just looking at men and women. Guess what? We found the same thing when we looked at geographic region, 
We found the same thing when we looked at disciplines. We found the same thing when we looked at levels of development. We found the, found the same thing when we looked at employment sector. Okay, so that's the sad news. Now the happy news. With the multivariate analysis, um, you know, I can look at these other things, and that gives us an opportunity to learn some lessons. Maybe there are places, our disciplines, our employment sectors that are doing, you know, that, that women's experiences are more positive than men's experiences, or at least the same as men's experiences. And if so, you know, maybe we can learn lessons from those. So doctoral studies. I think the mathematicians are gonna like this one. Respondents who had studied in math programs were more likely to have a positive relationship with their advisors than respondents in all other disciplines. That's after accounting for age, region, development index. So what is it about math, Marie Francoise? What is it about math? <laughs> Doctoral students who had studied in Northern America rated their program quality higher. Students who studied in Northern America and in Oceania were more likely to have a positive relationship with their advisor. Maybe we could go learn lessons in those countries and regions. So when we get, that's a good question, thank you. This, Marie Francois is saying this for men and women. Yes, when we're looking at, at the other things, when we're looking at region, when we're looking at discipline, we're looking at men and women together. We did not do the analysis to distinguish between men and women, or we haven't done it yet. That's a more involved analysis. So this is just students in this region and students in that region. The higher a nation's score on the Human Development Index, the lower the rating of program quality, the lower the rating of advisor relationship. Perhaps what, because I come from a very highly developed country, I think, well, that can't really be true, can it? Because that's where I went to school. So for all of these, we don't know if perceptions are driven by higher expectations, by lower expectations, but they're certainly reality people are perceiving. So what, what can we do about that? So in some cases, these may differ from the bivariate analysis because we're now taking into account confounding factors like discipline, like age, like employment sector. So yes, where, where they differ, it's, the bivariate may show men having more positive experience in some area than women. And if it doesn't agree with the multivariate analysis, that means that difference really isn't because of men and women that difference really is because of some other confounding factor. Did I mess up? Ah, one of them's clearly wrong. I will check and I will let you know. Yes, thank you for catching me on that. So we'll skip past that slide. That doesn't mean that that's wrong. It just means that it's a different variable. Oh, right. Right, sorry, this, yeah, right, they're not wrong. This is the development index, which, yes, Northern America is highly developed. But it's not the only highly developed. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. So this is, this is holding geographic region constant and looking only at the human development index. So for example, that'd be like, would that be like comparing, um, there's gotta be also sort of paperwork. 
Would that be um, like comparing uh, only very highly developed countries to each other? So it would be like comparing North America to Western Europe. Yes, that's exactly what that is. Thank you. Now, is everyone thoroughly confused? Okay, let me. Here, we're looking at the map. And we're holding the development index constant. Okay, so there can be countries in a geographic region with different development indices. Okay, so here, that doesn't matter. The development index is being held constant. So essentially, it's in the same country. So Northern America rated it higher than the other regions. And there are also other regions that are very highly developed or largely very highly developed. Because you can go to that map on the second page, too, and see the regions. This is now looking at the development index. So there are other regions that are very highly developed in addition to Northern America. So overall, those regions where the development index is higher, actually it's not the regions, it's not the country level because the development index was about a country, tend to rate the quality of their doctoral program lower. So you have to step back and remember what's being held constant, everything else. So here we're keeping the region constant and changing the development index. Here we're keeping the development index constant and changing the region. It's, it's, it's a subtlety, I agree. And one that I was going to walk right past. Thank you, Rachel. Respectful cohort. Was that another question? Yes. <laughs> Holding a variable constant is a very good thing in statistical analysis. It means that I can consider only, here I can consider only changing the human development index, but I'm not going to change a region. So I might have to move from one country to another country in the same region, but the development index changes. Yes, no, no. Yeah, let's hold that till after, because we're, we're, I'll go through these, and I promise I will come back to holding everything else constant. Because that's a, it's a, long answer. it's a very long answer. Um, respectful coworkers, look at all these employment sectors where the respondents reported feeling they were treated more respectfully than respondents in academics and government entities. What can academics learn from industry? It's a rhetorical question, yes, sorry. Respondents in Northern Europe were more likely to agree their coworkers treated them with respect. And the higher the human development index, the more likely the respondent is to agree that their coworkers treated them respectfully. And again, those last two are rhetorical questions. Discrimination. Here's where the math and physics people will be, you know, happy to read this result. Respondents with a disciplinary background in math and in physics were more likely to have never experienced discrimination than those in other disciplines. <laughs> Rachel's theory is that's because they're all men. But, that was held constant. but the gender was held constant, so that doesn't matter.
the higher the human development index, the more likely respondents were to have reported never experiencing discrimination. Northern America, Northern Europe, Oceania, however, were less likely to report never experiencing discrimination. So this is another one of those that's going to bother you with everything held, held constant. And I promise we'll come back to that. Because those seem counterintuitive, I understand. Industry and primary secondary schools, respondents working in those sectors were less likely to say that their career influenced their decisions about their personal lives. Respondents working in government and industry were more likely to say their rate of promotion had not changed after becoming a parent. Respondents in Northern America and South America were more likely to say their career influenced their decision about their personal decisions than respondents living in other geographic regions. Respondents working in Africa and the Caribbean and Central America, East Southeast Asia, Northern America, Western Asia, and Western Europe were less likely to say their rate of promotion slowed after becoming a parent. So this suggests that there are regional differences in the work-life balance. So you can go to that map on, on the second page, too. And all the regions that aren't listed <laughs> is what I'm comparing to. However, if we look only at the Human Development Index, there are no statistically significant differences about your career influencing your personal lives. So, based on respondents from about 30,000, there were 32,346 respondents to the first question. Um, but we had enough data from about 30,000 from 159 unique countries for our respondents, women's experiences in science are less positive than men's experiences. After accounting for age, and we used age because we asked what year you were born, and I'm using that as a proxy for your career stage. The older you are, I'm assuming the more advanced you are in your career, the younger, the less advanced. Discipline, employment sector, geographic region, and level of development. Now that's the last slide. So, holding everything else constant. Yes, yes. Thirty thousand is about what we were using in. Well, there were 8,000, so all of those were included in the analysis. I've only pulled out the stuff for those sectors, for those disciplines. So the question is, we had 30,000 and 20,000, so how many are actually included? So I was trying to highlight in that one slide with the 21,000, 22,000, the, the disciplines that were listed there. We used all available respondents in the analysis. And so we also had history of science. We also had other disciplines. I just pulled those out to talk about. So, so there were also several, <laughs> there were also several questions on the questionnaire about your discipline. There's the discipline you studied. I don't know, Rachel, you know that questionnaire better than I do. But it's possible that we're looking at different discipline questions. It's possible that this slide referred to one discipline question and the other numbers refer to a different one. And we can dig deeper and get you an answer on that. Yes. Uh, 
That's true. It can so age is a proxy for career stage. It can be different for men and women, and that's definitely true. But since we didn't have a question that asked about their career stage, that was the best I had and could use. Yes. So how much support did you get from your families? And we, we, frankly, for the preliminary report, ran into a time crunch and had not run that variable yet in the multivariate model. But I will. Right. So. So in the bivariates, it did show up that women were more likely to receive support, and I have not run that in the multivariate yet, and I will. There was a question over here first, and then we'll go back over there. Yes. To present it on the map? Okay, thank you. That's a good, good. Ah, yes, okay. So the question was, when I listed out all those regions, it might be easier if instead of listing out a bunch of regions, if I presented that with a map, you know, with some of them brighter and some of them less bright, that might be more helpful. Any other? Yeah, I, I just wanted to comment what my Francois said about women reporting more support from families. I think it's true because men actually get support from the wives or from the partners, and not from families, probably. So yes, we will look at that in the multivariate. But um, yes, I guess it's difficult to do the survey, but if you could uh, uh, ask about how many women uh, dropped their career because they did not have support. <laughs> Exactly, but that, that, that I think should be considered. Yeah, and another question. Sorry. A rhetorical question. Yeah, because you, you have, how did career influence your marriage and family? But uh, what about the converse? So how did the family relationships affect your career? Well, I mean, we have some of that. Like, here's the dual career question. Becoming a parent, did my career change after I became a parent? So we have some of that. So if I understood well, most of the survey was on perceptions on realities. And that's important, but humans is notorious to have mistaken per perceptions. So do you have some more objective data to compare these, uh, some, at least some of these results to and uh, do a parallel, see if uh, it's really a ground problem or if we need more propaganda of sorts. So um, the results uh, mirror, we could not have objective measures of career progress because that's different in different countries but the results mirror um, studies that have been done in Europe and Northern America in the US that do look at different rates of promotion and different rates of tenure. So those are shown to have, um, fam family situations shown to have effects on that. 
in those regions. Um, we don't, I don't think there's data on some of the other regions. Uh, you, but your point is well taken. Comparable proportions? Oh, th those studies didn't calculate the odds ratios like we did. But um, I can give you references if you want during the break. Hi, thanks Susan and Rachel. Our eager Twitter audience is eager to know whether the results of the survey will be made public and I've answered that there will be uh, to a certain extent in the report that will be published, but will they be also available in a kind of uh, URL or some other uh, interface? Okay, so now the project is not finished. As I said, we are going to discuss the results and recommendations and here now. So you get this report as part of being a member of this uh, group. You don't distribute it because it's not final. It's not the final report. Once we have a final report, the final report will be published uh, on the website of the project. It will be also published as a book. But for the moment, this is not yet the final report. The final report will look like that. It will include updated reports from the three tasks. And for example, Suzanne just said that she will include something more. And then probably also after the discussions of the two other tasks, we are going to include something more. And for the synthesis and recommendations, we are going to include something more. So it is not the final report, but the final report will look similar to that with, of course, more references, also it will look more professional. It will be a book and it will be available online. For the moment, if you distribute it, please say it's nothing but a preliminary report. We have already a long list of typos and things like that, so it's not the final report. But then the idea was that people could submit proposals to analyze part of the data. Are you going to tell how that's going to happen? No? Oh, the question was if, if the data was going to be made available. So if people... The results. The results of the... Of oh, I understood it was about the data. Okay, so the... So that's a more complicated question. And uh, it's not yet uh, resolved. For the moment, the data are with AIP, and there are conditions for people to access to the data, which are to go through uh, uh, um, application and so on. So we are go it's part of what we are discussing. Right now, we don't know if the data are going to be available. We hope they will be, but we don't know. But as in terms of the results of the project as analyzed by the various uh, task groups, they will be available and public. Okay. The issue with the data is that the respondents were promised confidentiality and it doesn't take many cuts in the data until you get down to where in some of the smaller fields um, or even not in a small field you could potentially identify people. So that's why we can't provide an answer to that question right now because we're still working on it and data suppression techniques and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Hi, at this stage I've got two comments. One is, I think it would be wonderful to compare these results with quantitative survey results, perhaps through Saga surveys, or perhaps through the surveys that have been done um, from PISA and see if similar results um, are emerging. And this is a comment for the question. Okay. Um, and the, the second comment was, um, I believe the results are emerging where there are major gender gaps. And these can guide us in what we actually do, what actions we undertake. And I'd like to check that I'm right that some of the major ones in the gender gaps are the experience of discrimination 
and in other parts of the survey, discouragement. We know that women leave faster than men um, from other surveys. The slower career after becoming a parent and the experience of harassment. Um, and I think these provide guidelines towards where the major impact could be made in terms of our action. Thank you. So regarding comparing to other surveys, it could only be done in a very broad or general sense because when, when you ask a different, if the questions are worded differently, then the results are not directly comparable. Um, so this is a question for my Rachel, my Francoise. In the first meeting in Paris, we discussed about data availability, uh, maybe by discipline, maybe by region, whatever. And we decided, I thought, that there would be a committee uh, formed, and that committee would look at requests for data and decide whether uh, the data would be handed or not. And my question is, has been, this committee has been already formed or not, not yet? Not to that, no, not, my, not to my knowledge. Oh. Yes. But so the answer, the, sorry, the answer is yes, we have a committee which is the coordination group of the project. But the only request that was examined this year was coming from a group in Russia. They wanted to get uh, data from Russia and the Russian zone in order to do some gender gap analysis. And it was, we can say, poorly formulated. So there were some uh, back and forth uh, connection with the group saying, please uh, reformulate and say how you are going to protect the data and so on. We, get, we maybe received three successive answers and at the end it was not satisfactory and at the end they, they never came back. So there is a mechanism? There is a mechanism, but, in, in, but the only example we had didn't work. So, okay, so let's try to do it for mathematics. Maybe it will work. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, okay. I'm going to okay. go back to holding other things constant. And thank you so much for asking that because I now get to put up some slides that, this is fine, I now get to put up some slides that I originally didn't put up. So let me just warn you. <laughs> You're about to see a lot of numbers. I mean a lot of numbers. Please don't focus too much on the numbers. Just look at the technique. I'm, I'm looking at Igle. She has seen these slides. Um, the, this is the output from the multivariate regression for how would you rate the quality of your doctoral program. Well, basically, we're just saying your answer, quality, is a function of all these variables. Plus, yep. oh, plus constant. And plus error. Plus error. So that's, that's what we're looking at. And um, so what we mean by holding other things constant we mean not changing, so, so these are the coefficients, and then you have the value, which in some cases is a binary, yes, no, one, zero, from in that region or I'm not. In some cases is a continuous, the age, the development index. So when I say holding everything else constant, I mean I'm changing the coefficient for male, female, and holding everything else constant, not changing any of those inputs. Does that answer that question now better? And then the way you look at this, so you also have to have a reference category. So for male, we made the reference category female. Reference categories are just arbitrarily picked. The, re the results don't really matter on which one you pick. You just have to pick one. So in this equation, then, you get a one if you're a male. And yep. Yeah, so here your input would be one if you're male, zero if you're not. And so there's no coefficient computed for women. 
And so there, the age is just your age. Uh, there is, there's the history and philosophy of science, which we did include in the regressions, but not in the report, which I can go back and correct. Um, so the first thing we have to do is, oh, I didn't finish reference category. For the disciplines, we arbitrarily picked astronomy. Again, it's arbitrary. The results don't change. For region, we arbitrarily picked Western Europe. And we didn't have to have one for the development score because it, it's, a, it's a continuous variable. It's from 0 to 1. So, and these are in different groups, so you can only look at one group at a time. So what do I mean by that? Well, for example, here I'm looking just at gender. Oop. I'm looking just at gender. So the first thing I have to do is I have to look at that p-value. You always have to look at the p-value first. And my p-value that I was looking for was 0 0.002. If I'm less than 0 0.002, I say it's significantly different. Yes? It was within a series, when we had a series of questions that were all basically the same question with a lot of subparts. Okay. Okay, so you were doing it. The question was, how did I calculate the denominator for the Bonferroni? And it was by pieces of the questionnaire. Like, for example, there was a question that asked about resources, and so that had 14 parts or something. So, but so then did you count, did you do the test to multiply it by the number of questions in that category, or did you, because you said there were like 14 subquestions about something? I think we used 14 questions by discipline, by region, by... Um, okay, so you, you multiplied. Right. Right, then, the, the whole yeah, so you have to multiply, she's saying you have to multiply, yeah, so I'm multiplying the number of parts by two, by two for the gender, by however many regions, by however many um, disciplines to get all that in there. And then I'm using that as the denominator. Maybe that's clear as mud would be what I would say in Texas. Um, so, oh, well, I'm not, I'm not through yet, Selena. <laughs> then I can look at discipline. So now I'm just looking at the blue section. It doesn't look blue back here. It doesn't look blue back here. I'm just looking at this section right here that's bigger and bolded. Well, it's only bolded if it was significant. And so here I have biology and math that were significant. You also have to know the value, whether high is, is a more positive answer or a more negative answer. Okay, so I think we are yeah. going to finish here. If you want to keep on discussing with Susan and Rachel, you can do so during the coffee break. So we'll be back in half an hour? Or what time do you think? Eleven thirty. Eleven. At 11, so we will be back at 11.15. Thank you.